Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to the Ethical Headness Arts and Culture Show for, for Christmas 2020. It's very exciting to be presenting the latest Ethical Headness chat show from the Bentner Botanic Garden, which is England's hottest garden, an absolute subtropical Eden on the south coast of the Isle of Wight, where it's always summer and it's been a a wonderful refuge to escape to um, during the pandemic. It, it's, a, it's a really inspirational place and it's very exciting to be able to uh, present a show with the botanic chef, Brad Rowe, who has become an expert in using food as medicine and curious and delicious ingredients from this beautiful garden that, that actually came into being during the reign of Queen Victoria her doctor decided that the climate in the famous undercliff where we are this evening was absolutely perfect for getting over respiratory diseases. And um, maybe that's also true again um, during the pandemic. So I would like to welcome Chef Brad Rowe and, and his uh, assistant for, for one evening only, which is a lovely Indy, who is an apprentice gardener and she is an extraordinary source of exciting information about the plants, flowers and herbs in the various different gardens um, in the botanical garden. There are lots of different room sets at Bentner Botanic and so you can literally travel around the world in this extraordinary garden. So we're going to start off with a, um, an interesting appetizer. So Brad, what have, you, what have you got for us uh, this evening? I know that you've used some beautiful lemon verbena from the, from the garden, which is wonderfully fragrant. What are you, what are you doing with lemon verbena and what flavours are you pairing it with? Well, tonight I thought I'd extract a lot of the garden's flavours, basically, into our local products. Like, for example, we've raised the lamb, sorry, the duck with lemon verbena, and we reduced it all the way down. So, so what, what, what kind of flavours does the, the lemon verbena, which makes a, a wonderful uh, uplifting tea, how, like how does that pair with, with duck? Why did you choose lemon verbena to go with duck, which is quite rich? Yeah, I've noticed everyone always does like a sweet uh, relish with duck. But I found if you do like a natural lemon reduction, you want to almost get a kind of lemongrass. Kind of flavor. Mm. So, so, so quite so quite fragrant. Absolutely. Now I know that you've used a, a curious berry as well um, to accompany this dish. Do oh, you yes. want to I'm going to reach over and show everyone these berries. I hope you can see them. They they look a little bit like a blueberry. I actually tried some early earlier and um, they do taste delicious. They've got a very um, botanical flavor, but they're very dry if you eat them raw. So much better to actually put in a dish with, with other flavors. You almost like uh, ginger and blueberry flavor. It's from the ginger family, right? It's just, uh, what is exciting is to see how many ingredients in this botanical garden are actually edible. And then of course, some of them have also got medicinal properties as well. Absolutely. So um, tell us a little bit more uh, about what, what, what goes into this um, starter with the duck. I think you've got a very interesting ingredient called cornus capitata, which um, Indy foraged um, yesterday to, to go in the, in the dishes that we're preparing and cooking tonight. Yeah, this little baby, uh, almost got like a white peach, very mild white peach kind of flavor. Now those are real Alice in Wonderland berries. Let, let me have a look, Brad. So I hope everyone can see. It actually looks like a strawberry and uh, it's got little little markings on it. And when, when they are ripe, they literally fall onto the, onto the floor in the garden. And if they're really ripe, they just fall apart. And you'll see a sort of pink mushy mess, but they're absolutely delicious. And later, we're going to show you how you could pair an exotic botanical fruit like this with dark chocolate fondant cake, which we've also made. So very Alice in Wonderland, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, so we can cook as well. We just bake them with a little bit of sugar. 
and you put, put, push them through a little sieve yeah. to get the seeds out as well. Should you not seeds. should you not eat the seeds, Brad? You can, but they're more like real harm right. texture. Okay, well now the proof is in the eating. So um, right. I can see the, the dish is, is cooking away. Do you want to show everybody the dishes? So it's some really lovely autumnal flavors. Wonderful. In fact, I'm going to just get up and come and have a look. And back to the good so, old-fashioned old uh, rosemary. Yeah. Mixed with chorizo. Could I have, a, have a snack? Can I have be naughty? And... Yeah, absolutely. Rosemary yeah. thick, 20 feet away from the it, it has got a really aromatic um, aroma to it. And I love the contrast between the chorizo and what is the vegetable? Oh, just potato, potato. Uh, chorizo and rosemary. Really, really lovely, warming, autumnal color. Exactly. And that just it's looks so, so rich and yeah. um, comforting. Absolutely. Really, really vibrant. Colors, yeah, you cook the chorizo first to get the oil out, yeah. and you cook the potatoes in the oil to get all that chorizo flavor. I don't even want a close up of the. Um, yes, I'm sure everybody blueberry. would love to to see these. So that's basically rich colors. Uh, tomatoes, I like tomatoes baked in the oven with balsamic. So it. the island, of course, is is one of the the best places to grow tomatoes uh, in the UK. Again, because we, we get a lot more sunshine here and uh, the tomato store, which is it's very famous for growing uh, tomatoes sustainably, is based on the Isle of Wight. So tomatoes are a local delicacy. So I'm looking forward to having a little taste. And the corner's Capitana. I made a nice pumpkin relish. Yeah. 20 pumpkins grown the other day. <laughs> so we just made it into a relish with the Cornus Capitana. Uh, now, pump. what is it like to have this extraordinary larder that you can literally wander out into the garden, Brad, and go and pick your produce to go with local seasonal meat and of course fish, local fish from our, literally the fisherman is, is just round the corner from us. Oh, what what is it like to have that larder literally in your garden to play with? That's amazing. It's almost like going back to college 20 years ago, where just new ingredients, just every five feet you walk is a new ingredient. And, and who, who are you inspired by um, as a chef, Brad? Um, I've got quite a few. What or who has inspired your food? Um, that's a good question. Basically, uh, Benilio Martinez comes to mind, a restaurant in Peru, where he takes ingredients from the Amazonia. So ingredients from the rainforest. Yeah. Again, is he is he using ingredients that the Amazonian um, Indians would use in their traditional cooking? Is exactly. He... And he puts it into a blue format, basically to a free mission style restaurant called Central in Peru. Amazing. And there's a finished, finished dish. Very exciting. I can't wait to taste it. You've got the corners capitata, which is almost like a peach. Yeah. Peachy kind of flavour and the pumpkin relish, which accentuates the lemon verbena in the stew. Do you have a spoon and then I'll, I'll show everybody. And I, I really hope you can see just the, the rich autumnal colours, the browns and the golds. Um, it looks extraordinary. So I'm, I'm just going to have a little taste. Wow, that is absolutely delicious. It's um, it's like comfort food, comfort food on a plate. Sorry, we can't see when you show things down because of the screen. You need to hold them up at an angle. Right. Okay. No, still can't see it. Sorry. Well, um, I've tasted it, but maybe it would be better if I put it back on the um, back on. If we put it back on the... Uh... Right. 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 Yep. It's absolutely delicious. Very, nice. very rich with lots of aromatic flavors coming through.
can you, um, if you focus on it, we, we've got two cameras, so you should be able to see it on the, on the other camera. So, have you, can you, can you display the, the dish, Brad, so everybody can see it? I think people are having a problem actually seeing it. And then, so he's just finishing off the dish. And also, from the garden, we have a plant called the canna plant. Yeah, um, Brad, people want to see the dish. So, he, Brad is, is obviously loves, cares very much about the presentation and he's prepared this beautiful leaf from the garden as well to show off the food. I think I can see it very clearly. Can you all see it now? Yes? It looks amazing. And it tastes absolutely delicious. And will this be on the menu at the Botanic Garden now that we've come out of lockdown again? Will people be able to come and sample this dish at the Botanic um, Edulis restaurant? Absolutely. Yeah. So you'll be able to come and sample it. And, and I can tell you it's absolutely yummy, a really warming, warming dish, very filling. And the canna leaf is just uh, flash fried on both sides. Right. And then baked in the oven for two hours to get dehydrated. Gosh, that's so a long, a long time. Basically a crispy leaf. Okay, that's uh, wonderful. Well, I, I now need to move on to talk to our other guest, um, Carl Honore, who I would like to welcome this evening. Hello, Carl. How are you this evening? Hello. I'm very well. I'm now ravenously hungry. But <laughs> yeah, yes, me, me too. I'm hoping to raid the the kitchen at the at the end of the show. So now you're you're known as the the prince of slow, and <laughs> you've written uh, at least three best-selling books on how to slow down, and you've done some uh, very very popular TED talks on slowing down. What, I, what I'd like to ask you is, did you live a very fast life as a journalist? I mean, you're a fellow journalist and being a journalist is not a particularly slow profession. You know, we're always chasing stories and we always have deadlines. Did you find that you were living a very hectic life? And did you come to a point where you needed to make a change? Was, was that how you got into exploring the idea of slow? Yeah. I think that when people get stuck in fast forward and find themselves, as I did, racing through my life instead of living it, <laughs> that it's often a shock to the system where you need a wake up call to make you realize that this just can't go on. I think a lot of people that wake up call comes in the form of an illness and the body one day says no more, you know, have a burnout or whatever it is. I had a rather different wake up call. It came when I started reading bedtime stories to my son and, and I was just so fast in those days that my version of Snow White had three dwarves in it, right? I mean, it was, it was not a, it was a very unedifying spectacle. And, and I got to the point, I actually hit rock bottom when I, I heard about a book called The One Minute Bedtime Story. So, you know, Snow White in 60 seconds. And I, I remember thinking, I need that book now, right? Amazon, drone delivery. But, but then light bulb over the head. And I thought, this is just not working, right? I need to, I need to under, not only understand my addiction to speed, but do something about it. And that was kind of the spark for me to launch myself into what's ended up being a kind of crusade of many years. <laughs> so how did you start and how did you make changes? And, and I'm curious to know how you were able to continue as a journalist. Did you have to make some very big changes in order to slow down, but still make a living? Yeah. Um, Is it possible to slow down dramatically, still make a living and, and deal with demanding people around us because life is speeding up. It isn't going in the slow direction. Uh, you know, the way we live now with the internet has, has made life faster than, than it certainly was when I entered journalism. Yeah, it, it, we certainly have the tools to go faster and many of us use them chronically. <laughs> Chronically and addictively. Yeah, yeah, in, in a way that ends up uh, backfiring on us in every sort of way. I think that we have choices. We often have many more choices than we think we do when it comes to how many things we try to cram into the average day, 
how often we look at our screen, how often we how often we go on social media and find ourselves scrolling enviously through other people's feeds for hours on end. I mean, these are choices that we make, right? It's it's not like there's this kind of wall of cultural pressure that just leaves us no option and no wiggle room and we have to go fast. We, we're constantly every day making decisions. And a big part of slowing down is pausing. And I think in some ways that's one of the silver linings of the pandemic is that it's been a global pause. And I think it's forced, you could say invited, but I think for a lot of people it's been forced a lot of us just to stop and to think and to reflect and to look at the big picture and to ask ourselves what really matters. And I think that's a first step really towards slowing down is, is not necessarily, of course there are small little hacks and lifestyle tips and things like, you know, how do you manage your inbox and turning off notifications on your phone, all that sort of stuff. But that's micro, right? The real way to get to this is the macro and it's, it's pausing, it's stopping, it's looking inside, it's sitting with the discomfort of the fact that you may have been living at the wrong speed and living the wrong life for some time and confronting those, I think inner demons is maybe not too big a phrase for it. And, and then working out what actually the next step ought to be, you know, what is your life going to look like? What do you, where do you want to be in five years time? Who are you, right? And, and how do you fit into the world? So I think one of the great ironies of the moment is that we're also impatient. We even want to slow down fast, right? So people very often say, oh yeah, this slowing down thing, I totally get it. I want to reconnect with my inner tortoise, but I want to do it by tomorrow morning, right? You know, I want to have the inner calm and the Dalai Lama by tomorrow afternoon. And it doesn't work that way, right? You don't suddenly sign up for yoga and then run across the street and do some meditation. You know, it's a, it's a process, it's baby steps. Often the journey away from your roadrunner self is two steps forward and one step back, right? And sometimes three steps back. But eventually you you move forward you know, over time and you get to a state where you just, I mean, I, now I have a very clear before and after, right? I used to be rushed all the time. I was always with one eye on the clock and, and I-, I just, And do you, you honestly not do that at all anymore? What's that? You don't do that at all anymore. I just don't feel rushed anymore. I mean, I still have a very, well, I did till the pandemic hit, you know, very, uh, you know, exciting life of travel and so on. And I just didn't, I don't feel rushed. And it, partly it's a kind of change of chip. You know, I arrive at each moment thinking, not how can I get through this moment as fast as possible, but how can I get through it as well as possible? You know, how can I get the most out of this moment rather than how can I multitask my way through five moments at the same time? So that's a kind of systemic internal shift, but then I've made all kinds of other changes. I mean, you asked me about journalism. I, I was never a kind of day-to-day -day news journalist anyway. I was always a kind of longer term features writer. So I always had time to step back, stroke my chin, you know, you were, so I, I, and then I moved away from journalism, right? So I moved, I moved into writing books. So journalism, I think of as a sprint. I'm doing the same kind of writing, but I'm doing a marathon now in the form of books. Right, but presumably you have, you, you'll have, you know, you've got your publisher and there's always pressure, outside pressure from agents and publishers when you're writing books you'll have a, a deadline but are you saying that do you still work very much in the same way with deadlines but you've got rid of a lot of the extraneous noise that was making you waste time go faster feeling stressed have you exactly. got, I think we, got rid of all of that we, we we all have deadlines and and deadlines are not a bad thing right we all know that they can focus the mind they can get us to that point where we can pull it over the line. But the trouble I is if you get stuck in deadline right. mode, right? It's the difference between being in deadline mode so that you, okay, let's say you finish up a bit of work, it's 5 p.m. you or six or whatever, you get it out the door and then you go downstairs and eat dinner as though you're on a deadline. That's the trouble, right? So it's about sort of shifting gears and knowing when to step up and channel your inner hair and then when to step back and channel your inner tortoise, right? It's sometimes you lean in, but sometimes you lean back, right? Sometimes you're on, sometimes you're off. And it's kind of about having the discipline, the imagination, and also the courage, I think, to say, this is my tempo. This is my rhythm. This is the speed at which I will be the best employee, client, neighbor, friend, partner, parent, whatever. You know, if, if I'm allowed to maneuver this moment, move through this space at my speed, right? And, and that's, that, that's not something you just snap your fingers and you know, conjure up instantly. But once you get there, you look back at your earlier self and just think that was ludicrous, right? That was just, I was wasting my time by rushing. Cause this is one of the 
the paradox is people say, well, I'm, I can't slow down. Life will pass me by. Life is what's happening right here and right now. And the only way to live it and get the most of it is to slow down and be in it, right? Rather than be- Some of the slow things that you do luxuriantly. I mean, you like cooking like, like yeah. I do, don't you? So I have found that spending more time cooking, I've always cooked, but spending more time in between writing and work and running the magazine is very therapeutic. And the act of switching off and, and preparing food and ingredients and enjoying it is like a meditation and it's incredibly relaxing and at the end being someone who loves food you've got the reward of a, <laughs> slow, a slow delicious meal which really helps you to switch off and relax and in the past I would have thought I didn't have enough time to, to take that much time but you feel better because you've eaten a really good meal and you've relaxed while you were making it so when you go back to work you're more effective yeah, so I mean, this it, is, it, it's a, an example of where you think you don't have enough time, but you do. How has your life changed in ways that you that you embrace slow activities like cooking? What what do you do that is decadent? Well, you've slow? said cooking. I mean, I would definitely that would be and always has been top of my list. I think it for me, it's it's like yoga, right? <laughs> Doing cooking and, and then all the kind of sensual hedonistic joy that comes from eating they describe so it's it's the journey but it's also the destination food right I mean it's the perfect tag team and I mentioned yoga I mean I've, I, I took up yoga I do sort of some meditation and breathing I, I used to be somebody who didn't spend a lot of time in nature but I mean we know now that being in in in, in mother nature and green spaces has a palpable effect on our minds and bodies it sort of soothing and makes us feel more serene and so on and lowers um, stress and so I'm somebody who gets out into nature much more than I did before. Uh, I've always been quite an urban person, but I, I love a good long walk now, <laughs> the kind, you know, in parks or the countryside and so on. Yeah. Um, so those are some of the things that I, uh, reading I think is very, very important. I'm a, I'm a, a words person and I, I don't ever read, I, you know, I love, I'm not a Luddite. I love, I've got an iPhone and I've got a MacBook, but I don't read on a screen. I don't read, I read novels for fun and I read them always tactile. In a, in a, in a, in a book. book. To get away from the screen, and we know a lot of the research shows as well that there's a different, a different reading when a screen is a diff, it's a different register, it's a different, there's a different level of engagement, and and plus, I many of us spend most of our working hours gazing at a screen. I think just to shift gears, to move into a different mode, and and have a book in your hand. Um, so I'm at the moment I'm reading Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel, which is a great big chunk oh. of 500 odd pages. And I look forward to it every evening, you know. The drama was absolutely um, um, incredible, the, the dramatization. I'm looking forward to seeing that because I guess, I'm guessing it's uh, Mark Rylance is probably playing Thomas uh, Cromwell. He's That's coming. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, how long would you spend reading, reading in the evening? I, I try to spend at least, I, I say try as though it's a chore, it's not. I usually end up spending about 45 minutes. Um, and I think that's another thing that everybody, I do a lot of work in Silicon Valley. This is something you hear from all those, you know, tech nerds out there with their phones and their tablets. You know, they've read all the research and crunched all the numbers. They don't look at a screen wherever possible for at least an hour before going to bed, right? They need to slow down the, like all that blue light. And they just need that slow buffer from a fast day to segue serenely, calmly efficiently even if that's the right word into sleep so for me I fill that buffer with uh at the moment Hilary Mantel what what benefits have you noticed from a health point of view a stress point of view from slowing down over the past decade well I definitely think health energy I mean again this is I always think of it as the delicious paradox of slow that people think of slow as lazy torpid like a like a slow. right it's it's a four letter word it's a pejorative in our culture but actually if you get it right it's magic right it just unleashes everything and and i I've, I've got so much more energy having slowed down than i had when i never slowed down right i mean we all know that and that's how you end up burned out that's how you end up measuring your day in coffee spoons right because you just can't get through the day without a, ca a caffeine jolt i've i feel like i've just got more get up and go more oomph right um, are, you, are you happier as well? Would you oh, say yeah. much greater levels of happiness and contentment? And has it improved your relationship? 
I mean, do you, is it also about making more time, you know, for your family and friends? Yeah, Not definitely. something I don't have time to do that now and, and having a closer yeah. relationship with your children. Well, we're, in a way, we're kind of cycling back to what I was saying at the beginning is the choices we make. And one of the central governing, all determining choices we make is how we use our time. And if you think of people, no one lies on their deathbed and looks back and thinks, I wish I spent more time on Instagram or more time at the office or more time shopping, right? And yet, what are we devoting the bulk of our time to those things, right? Um, so I guess what I've done, rather than waiting to my, to my deathbed, is make a different choice about how I use my time now. So, you know, I, I love my work. I get lots done. I'm, I'm going to look back. I know because I look back every few years and look, and I think, yeah, you know, I've, I've hit, in many ways hit it out of the park and I've really enjoyed it. And I'm pretty sure I'll feel that way looking back from my deathbed. But at the same time, I've also carved out so much more time for the stuff we've been talking about, cooking, reading, and then the relationships. That's so important as well, because that's something we sacrifice on the altar of speed is human relationships need time. They need presence, they need space, they need oxygen. You know, you can't make someone fall in love with you faster because you want to get married next month, right? It doesn't doesn't work that way. You can't download a friendship because you need someone to backpack around Asia with you. <laughs> These things take time. You need to slow down, listen, be with the person, sometimes be in uncomfortable silence, right? But if you allow yourself to sink into that slow moment with another person, well, that's when the lights turn on, right? That's when things start to spark and happen. So, so would you say that you're having it all, having slowed down? <laughs> right. Doesn't sound very slow, does it? Um, that's like, uh, well, I, I suppose the way I'd flip that around and ask is, am I missing anything at the moment? And I can't honestly think of anything that, I suppose in a way, the flip side of not being able to answer the question, what are you missing in your life is maybe you kind of do have it all. I don't know. I mean, that sounds so. so but you don't, you don't, you don't feel you're missing anything. What no, about, I mean, really one of your interesting questions in one of your, one of your books is, um, is slowing down compatible with, you know, the materialistic world that we live in and um, with capitalism? What, what do you say to that? It, does, it, does it require I, living I, on less? I mean, do you earn less money now, Carl, as a result of slowing down? Or, or has it actually made you more successful? Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably varies from person to person. I mean, I, I personally, I mean, I guess now if I, I've been doing this now for 16 years, so it's hard to compare what, I mean, I, I'm, I'm definitely earning more than I, I was 16 years ago. But slowing uh, down has been a really good finance. Yeah, for, <laughs> but I think for, for other people as well, I mean, it's about choosing how you slow down. I mean, it could be as simple as, you know, you pull one lever and that's you in, in build a, a, a nap into your working day, right? And and suddenly you're sharper, you make fewer mistakes, you're better with clients, and the bottom line looks rosier, right? So there are all kinds of little injections of slow that people can do that can actually make them, you know, better in the workplace. Well, you know, I, I think there is a there is a tendency to work for the sake of it when you should have stopped two hours ago, and you're actually not doing anything great but you're obsessed with carrying on working, at which point you're not gonna be effective. And if you actually went off and cooked a meal, went for a walk and entirely switched off, you, you would do your job, whatever it is, better. And that we, we have this culture of overworking, mm. of pretending to work even, or faffing around on our phones, when if we were truly switching off, we would be happier and we would have time to re recharge. Well, it's the, it's the tyranny of what people call FaceTime, isn't it? The idea you've got to just simply be there in the office. Your body has to be there. You're probably producing absolutely nothing for the company. You're wearing yourself out. You're probably doing all kinds of harm to your relationship at home. You're missing out on your children, whatever. You're eating badly, but there you are. Your, your, your jacket is over your chair. Your face is in the office come 7.45. You know, it's, it's ludicrous. It's just... and. and there was just one example recently from the news. Uh, Microsoft Japan ran a one month experiment last year where they moved to a four day working week and productivity went up 40%, right? So it's just a reminder that's, and if anyone who sits down and looks at the way they work will realize that in, in the average day, nobody has eight productive hours, right? <laughs> I mean, it's just not humanly possible. Well, we're not designed to do that. You know, the circadian no. rhythm kicks in and 
every so often we will feel sleepy, but in the 21st century, a lot of people would override that with a cup of coffee or, yeah. a, or a chocolate bar. Mm -hmm. Or something even stronger. <laughs> or something stronger, yeah. To wake yourself up and, and not relax for five minutes and daydream, which we're designed to do. Yeah, daydreaming is, I mean, I, I you know, long live daydreaming, right? But I mean, it's the ultimate it's the cardinal sin of the 21st century because it looks like wasted time, right? But actually, I think of daydreaming as a little bit like, you know, the, those four by four puzzles with the 15 pieces? And there's one empty space in the puzzle that allows you to move all the other ones around. That's daydreaming, right? That's letting the mind wander. That's allowing you to rejig, recalibrate, make sense, put your feet down, work out. You know, if, if you've got a four by four, you've got all of the pieces filled, nothing moves. It's gridlock, right? It's, it's stasis, it's stagnation. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to have to welcome our other guest now, um, Britt, but we'll, I'm sure that we'll land up talking a, a little bit more about slow before the for the end of the show but it's been fascinating talking to you and uh, I also feel that you know the idea that you work yourself to death and then you retire is a crazy idea isn't it because a lot of people actually don't do well if they go from working incredibly hard to suddenly retiring they they don't know what to do with themselves and at that point they might also not be very well yeah, well, that's why the, at the after statistically the first year after retirement, a sudden retirement, automatic full retirement, yeah. death rates skyrocket, right? Yeah, yeah. My father died um, very shortly after retiring, and yeah, I, th I think it's it's we've got the balance wrong, haven't we? This idea of working so hard that you barely have a life, and then at the end of it, you do nothing. Why not change the way we work so that if you want to do, you could carry on working. Exactly, which is do less. Which is makes there are no rules, sense. right? As 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 lifespans get longer and longer, this this outdated, outmoded idea of working yourself to the bone until you're 59 or 63, and then just stopping. I mean, many people now can expect to live 30 30 years after that, maybe more, right? So it just we need to tear up the old traditional three-stage life path of learning, working, earning, and then pension leisure and create something much more fluid, much more bespoke, much more human, much more joyous, right? Well, the sloth is the symbol of ethical hedonist if, in case people hadn't noticed an upside down sloth because when I went to the rainforest with Daryl Hannon to do a, a story, uh, a sustainable fashion story, and to see the deforestation, we encountered this gorgeous sloth literally slinking through the, through the canopy, and it was called a kinkajou. And so that inspired the emblem of the magazine, which is a sloth I hanging have. upside down, basking. So I'm absolutely with you with the idea of slowing down in order to actually do more. And enjoy more. <laughs> and enjoy more, absolutely, and taste more. So let's let um, our lovely actress in from LA who's joining us, um, who, let's see if Britt is in, Dominic. Yeah. Dominic? Yeah, um, Britt, is, yes. is Britt in? Yeah. Hello, Britt. Hi. Hello. Hello. So hi, hi, hi. Hi, how, how are you? Um, I'm well, how are you? I'm in, I'm in the, the middle of a, a beautiful botanic garden on the south coast of the Isle of Wight, where it's actually pretty freezing <laughs> tonight. As uh, you know, it's, it's very much winter here now. It's been really, really cold. I'm imagining it's balmy in Los Angeles this afternoon. Yes. Damn it. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> We're getting chilly evenings, but the days are still full of sunshine and, you know, you can definitely get away with some short sleeves. Oh, how, how lovely. I've got, got that <laughs> to think about, uh, hopefully, uh, next year when, when summer returns. Anyway, it's lovely to have yes. you on the show. Um, Thank you. Rick. Now, I've, I've watched the film that you co-star in with Paul Bettany, which is called Uncle Frank. And I've, I've had a look at a lot of the other roles that you've um, played um, for Netflix and Amazon and in um, TV shows in America. 
And I've noticed that you play a lot of strong women. Is, is that something that you naturally <laughs> are drawn to? Or um, would, you, would you say that um, those are the sort of characters that come up in Hollywood, typically for women, I, you know, you've, you've played doctors and, and lawyers. Um, I've seen, seen quite a few of your, your recent roles. And in comparison, your character Charlotte in Uncle Frank, um, she's actually playing quite an intriguing character, isn't, isn't she? Would you like to tell our audience a little bit about Charlotte? And Yeah, um, Charlotte is, oh, go ahead. No, no, it's, it's fine, Britt. I think there's a slight delay because you're so far away. I was just going to say that, you know, Charlotte isn't typical of some of the other characters you've played, although she's actually very feisty too, isn't she? She's quite fearless mm -hmm. and um, provocative. So tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. your character in Uncle Frank and why. Yeah, I, I love Charlotte. Charlotte is, um, you know, a very, uh, when, when I think of like a bohemian 1970s lifestyle, Greenwich Village woman, you know, free love and bangle bracelets and gorgeous jewelry and long caftans. And, you know, she's, she's a lesbian and she has her best friends and um, they both happen to be closeted to their family. So she, yeah, so she plays, um, she plays Wally's wife. And uh, she plays Frank's girlfriend when his family comes to visit. So she's, she steps in to be their fake partner so that they don't have to come out to their family. Um, I think and we should, she does it with... I think we should just explain that? a little bit about Uncle Frank. Uh, the story of Uncle Frank. Yeah. Um, Paul Pitney plays gentle professor of English literature in the 70s. And it's a time when if you were a gay man in America at this time, it was illegal um, to be yes. homosexual openly and you could be arrested and thrown in prison for it, which is why Charlotte um, pretends to be the wife of um, Frank's boyfriend and Frank's girlfriend in front of his family because he is not able to be openly gay with his, uh, his family. And uh, it's about the conflict between his patriarchal father, who's a, a, a very fierce and intolerant and violent man who discovered Frank as a teenage boy with an, another boy and threatened to kill them if he ever found him engaging in any kind of gay activity again. And, and obviously he's very traumatized by it. And he's such a gentle character, isn't he? Brits. Mm -hmm. His character is, is really so well told in Uncle Frank. It's a, it's a gentle, life-affirming story about family, about love and forgiveness, ultimately. But, but your character, Charlotte, she's quite exotic and she's fearless and she's outrageous. I mean, she certainly makes her presence. Yes, absolutely. She's like this exotic butterfly. Yeah, yeah. I, I think... I think you have an interesting story, I think, story to tell us about your aunt, who actually is a similar character to Charlotte, uh, who helped her friends in the 70s. Would, would you like to tell us about, about her, Brit? Uh, yeah, so my, my aunt, um, I grew up in a small town in Alabama, um, and Alan Balls from Georgia. So a lot of these characters, I wasn't alive in the same time period, but the uh, cultural stigma of being gay in the South was still very much present when I was a teenager um, and had a lot of friends who were, who were in the theater department with me that, you know, I watched them come out to their families and watch uh, the deeply religious roots of our culture uh, work against them in a lot of ways. So it's, it's a familiar story that's still happening. Um, and I, I love that we got to go back to the 1970s because my aunt left uh, small town Alabama, went to New York and uh, she was an editor there. And um, I just, I, I really based a lot of this character off of my imaginings of her uh, with her friends in this, you know, 
wonderful place where anybody could be anything they wanted to be. And it was almost like they were so far away from their families. They just didn't have that responsibility anymore to be the person that they were supposed to be. Um, and my aunt had uh, many wonderful gay friends in, in the theater. And um, she was actually the person who introduced me to the first openly gay couple I'd ever met. Um, when they came back through Alabama, I was waiting tables at a, at a restaurant and uh, they came in and um, it was, uh, his name was Terry and he was with his partner. And I just, I, you know, she never, she's a very quiet, reserved person. So she was unlike Charlotte in that way. Um, but she would come out with just little stories here and there about, um, you know, um, a bisexual man that she dated at this one time and what, you know, that slightly complicated thing. She would very much understate these stories, but I had my imagination to kind of flesh out this idea of being there for your friends in the way that Charlotte was able to, in a way that, you know, growing up in the South, my my friends uh, who were gay, their parents all the time were like, oh, is Brittany your girlfriend? Is, oh, are you guys dating? There's just so much, um, there can be so much shame attached to that at a, at a really early age. And I think that's what Frank goes through. And I think it's wonderful to be able to escape to a place like New York in that time period, or even now for a lot of people, I'm sure, where they had chosen family. And I, I know that my family for many people in that community um, at that time. So she was really a lot of my inspiration and in coming up with my kids character for this film. There's a, um, Dominic, there's quite a lot of interference, is there? Yeah, I just believe that's the connection being from... It's just the connection between Brit and... Oh no! It's, a, it's okay, Brit. It, it, I just wondered if there's <laughs> anything we could do to improve it. I mean, the, it's fascinating to talk to you. I mean, the good, the good part about Uncle Frank is ultimately it works out for him, doesn't it? He, his father utterly humiliates and, and shames him from beyond the grave. Yes. Raving at him for being gay and, and leaving him out of, out of his will. But out of that, his family unite around him. And ultimately, yes. it's a story about love and acceptance, isn't it? Whoever it you is. are whatever you uh, want to be in life, that's, that's okay. I think the scary thing is that intolerance um, is on the rise again around the world. And, and in some parts of the world, um, people are persecuted again for their sexuality. It, I guess it's a constant state of flux, isn't it? You know, as in different parts of the world, in different cultures where religion um, impacts on a society and then they start to dictate what is considered acceptable and isn't. Um, but it can be so tragic for people affected by that. Um, now I know that you've um, played some Shakespeare roles. Do you enjoy being on stage as, as much as film work, Brit? And, and what would an ideal role look like for you? Who would you love to play? Let's see. I So my roots are from theater. I grew up doing theater. Um, I got my degree in theater and my, my master's in um, fine arts performance in theater. So it was, it was actually quite a switch for me to go to TV and film. But I found through the, through the many years that I was doing theater that I was really drawn to black box performances. I loved the really intimate spaces. And so when I finished my, my graduate degree, I really had this inkling that I wanted to try something as intimate as film um, or TV, having the camera be so close and the idea of, you know, being so close to someone in a black box theater, uh, the idea of being on their television in their home felt so intimate and it was something that I hadn't explored before. So that's how I made the leap. But I will say going back to theater is something that has always been on my on my list. I hope that I never, the last 10 years have been very focused on TV and film because I was exploring it as a new medium. Um, but I hope that theater will always come back around to me. Um, it's, it was my first home, my first space of freedom, my first 
expression as an artist. And um, I would say, so I, when I was in, in doing Shakespeare, I was very much in the world of playing the, the hero in Much Ado and playing the um, Jessica in Merchant of Venice. You know, I, in the rep, I was always the kind of the young intern that took on those roles. So I think for me, it would be uh, really exciting to get to go back and visit um, being Beatrice, you know, getting to be the feisty one and, and kind of like the, I really love the, the women that get to fight for something. Um, you know, I did play Ophelia at one time and I, and I think that there was a time in my life where I was very drawn to the fragile female character. And that just is not as interesting to me anymore. You know, I'd be much more interested in playing Gertrude. I'd, um, I'd be interested. You would play more fragile roles because having having looked at your work as an actor, mm. I noticed that most of your characters are very very strong women. Yes. And so, would you say that you naturally gravitate to to that kind of role, and as a result, get offered those kind of parts now? Yes, and I'm so grateful for that. You know, I mentioned that I grew up in the South and there was a lot of value culturally to being a a very um, demure, um, La you lady know, just person. ladylike, yes, going with very the flow, fancy. being easy and, and accommodating. And, you know, I'm so glad that I had theater because it was mostly through my exploration in theater that I... I was encouraged to go beyond the ingenue. Um, I was encouraged to drop these socialized they have learned in order to be, in order to feel accepted. Um, so playing the really kick-ass, loud-mouthed, unafraid, free woman is now um, one of my favorite things to access. Um, I like I like being in charge. I like being the lawyer. I like being the doctor. I like operating at the top of my intelligence in a powerful position. And I also like, you know, someone like Charlotte, who's powerful in a different way. She's just powerful in her freedom. You know, she doesn't have to explain herself to anyone and she loves to laugh. And I think that is that kind of exploration for female characters is, is the thing that gets me the most excited. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you is what what is what is the the state of of roles for women in Hollywood right now, and being a, a woman who is both attractive and highly intelligent because you're a member of Mensa, how yes. how does that impact on how you're treated as a female actress in Hollywood? I mean, have things improved? Uh, particularly, I'm I'm thinking of of what happened with Me Too and Harvey Harvey mm -hmm. Wine. I know there's a lot more protection, which should have come a lot earlier yes. for, for actresses not to be put in very, very difficult situations, but that has existed since the beginning of movies, that kind of exploitation. Do you feel safer as an actress in Hollywood? And do you feel that there are more intelligent, um, multi-dimensional roles for women in film right now? Are there, are there enough? Or is there still a lot of stereotyping? I do. I, I there is definitely growing, and I, I think it's it's important to recognize the amazing women that are coming out, that are creators, that are showrunners, that are producers. You know, someone like Reese Witherspoon, who was you know an Academy Award winner, and yet was struggling with the audition she was getting to play someone's wife, some big named actor's wife in a very one dimensional role, which is why she started her um, production company. And so she started taking on these best selling books about women, uh, written by women and producing them into these beautiful uh, films, you know, um, with Wild, and then um, jumping on board and starting to produce uh, the, the morning show. She's just doing incredible stuff. And, I, and she's not the only one, you know, Olivia Wilde stepping into being a director and being a producer, Phoebe Waller-Bridge show running Killing Eve, and then jumping in and doing Fleabag from her one woman show. It's, I think it's, it's interesting to me that it seemed to have taken women stepping out of the performing aspect only in order to be taken more seriously, um, being in more leadership positions, being a director, being a producer, being a showrunner. Um, but 
it's also because they become the decision makers. Do you think that's the only way it's going to continue to change if women become directors and producers, Brit? I really do. I really do. There, there are some wonderful allies out there, but I think ultimately the system, it, it's so systemic. Um, you, need, you need women in powerful positions making the decisions about what the scene looks like, about what, who gets hired and what they're wearing. I mean, I, I have always felt, I've been fortunate to always feel safe in the situations that I've been in, but more than once on set, I've had situations where all of a sudden uh, my character was in their underwear and it wasn't communicated to me and I'm in a fitting finding out that that's happening. Um, that's a problem. That's, that's something that shouldn't be happening on set. And right now with Me Too, the way that it unfolded, it put, it put the fear of God in everybody in the best way. And so, you know, I hate that it had to be fear um, in order for people to feel advocated for, but people are worried, you know, they're really worried and their, their intimacy coaches are finally being, it'd be like fight choreography. It's just like if I'm in a Shakespeare show and I have a fight scene, I have a fight choreographer, it is rehearsed. We do a fight call before the show. Everyone is kept safe. And those kinds of, those intimate scenes should be exactly the same. There shouldn't be any room for um, people to get taken advantage of, which is unfortunately what has happened in the past. Absolutely. Um, if we could take a break for a moment and Brad is going to uh, do another live cooking demo, which you can enjoy oh, wonderful. in the garden. We're going to do a, a main course now and then I'll, I'll have another, another chat with you before the Great. show um, ends. So Brad, what is, what is the main course uh, that you have come up with ingredients that Indy has foraged from right. the garden. For this is one of my most famous favorite ingredients in the garden. It's called Drummer Swin Terry. I don't know if you can get that. So this is, is this the spice bark? That's, yeah, straight from the bark. And the Drummer Terry tree, also known as winter bark. Okay, so Indy, would you like to, to tell us a little bit about the winter bark and um, where is it a native species? So it's found in the American part of the garden, which is recognised. Uh, it's got quite nice reddish bark, and obviously uh, the owner used very similar to a strong pepper. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And I believe at one time it was actually used as a substitute for pepper, yeah. and it's native to Chile. Um, and it's quite a you know, very Let large growing taste tree. a little bit. Yeah, Chile, Argentina. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Again, our, our American region. I never had peppercorns back there, so they just used that. It's peppercorns I should. It's also got a cinnamon. I'm just saying, I can smell of, cinnamon. Yeah, it's, it's very strong to it. <laughs> it's got a very, yeah, very um, aromatic aroma. And I used that dehydrated and ground up into a spice. Yeah. And that was on the, the lamb neck fillet, basically braised. So it, it's, uh, is this the winteri? Yeah. How do you pronounce it? Drimus um, winteri. Drimus winteri. Also known as winter bark. Winter bark, okay. And that'll just ground up into a spice. And then you a lamb fillet. Yes. And slowly braised for three hours. And underneath, we have a Hedicium cornbread. Not very popular in England, because it's one of my favorite cornbreads in America. As you know, from Alabama. Mm -hmm. so, uh, <laughs> I was about to say cornbread. Yeah. Brad actually chef in uh, in um, Las Vegas, Brit. Oh wow! Yes. Bringing cornbread to England. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing good work. <laughs> wow. so, looks looks delicious. Yeah. So the Hedicium lily. Don't even zoom into that red bit there. Can everybody see that's that? That's in the in the ginger family as well. So that's just a basic cornbread with the uh, hadikian. So it's like, almost like a ginger cornbread with the braised lamb on top. And on that is also going to be an arbiter's salsa. So can we just uh, just show uh, everybody the arbiter's? It's, it's like a strawberry. It, it almost got tiny little hairs on the out, outside. And there is a beautiful tree just outside in the garden, which is 
a stone's throw away from where we are. The garden is beyond, beyond us. And there is a strawberry tree and there are these bright pink fruit and they are delicious. And they're literally falling on the ground. It's December. About 20 feet um, away. Yeah, absolutely delicious. Very Alice in Wonderland. It's just full of curious plants. And, uh, the exciting thing is a lot of them are edible, although there are some poisonous plants. So you, you have to know what, yeah. what to forage. Basically, we cook these with a little bit of brown sugar and we sieve the seeds out and end, you end up with a, a nice pulp. And with that pulp, I put into a salsa ranchera, a traditional Mexican salsa. So you've got the nice charred uh, chilies and vegetables in the salsa with a little bit of sweetness. Can I, have a, can I have a taste? Absolutely. <laughs> well, there's got to, you know, got to be additional perks to the job. I was going to say, I Don't hope you can taste it. Taste I wish I could. A little bit spicy. Of what it tastes like. Wow. There's heat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hot. It's aromatic and hot at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's different mm. to eating a curry. Yeah. It's more sophisticated. More refreshing. Yeah. yeah, it's got a bit of a zesty, refreshing kick to it. Yeah, in the States and the Mexico, they've got mm. everything. Sort delicious. Of Absolutely yeah. delicious. And thank you. With, um, thank you, Brad. The sauce for mm. that is basically crab pear and figs roasted. And that's braised down with a little bit of cream. So there is the most amazing fig tree, which, I mean, do you think it's about a hundred years old, the, the fig tree in the yeah, garden? Yeah, I said about hundred, yeah. it, It's a massive tree that gnarled and curls down through the garden. It's enormous. And there were ripe figs on it in November, which we have um, been foraging and, and Brad has turned into jam. Absolutely delicious. Yeah, simply roasted and then boil down with a little bit of cream. I think the important thing is, is for people to be reconnected with where food comes from and that there is food all around us. Do, I mean, do you go foraging, Brent? Do you ever go foraging? You know, I have not been foraging. I happened to see the movie Into the Wild once upon a time where he foraged the wrong thing. And I got so scared by that, that it, it's, I will, I guess that's not true. If I go for a walk in Los Angeles, there are, we have these beautiful trees. There'll be citrus. We'll have lemons. We'll have um, uh, loquats, loquat trees. I love to grab from the loquat trees. People have grapefruits. Uh, I'm very careful about it. But I think that there's so much available that I am completely ignorant to. And I think um, any work that you're doing to bring light to, to the fact that we can forage is wonderful work. I think it, it, it basically connects you with your inner cave girl. You know, we're, um, man, yeah. we're, we're meant to get excited about going to look for food. I yeah. just get more exciting than going to a supermarket. I'd rather go... Mm and forage my food from the field, the forest, and the farmer. Um, yeah. There's no comparison with the freshness, the quality, or the nutrition when you buy food from farmers, fishermen, yes. real producers, and you also forage. It's exciting. It's exciting. I see, I've, I've taken the step to farmer's markets, which I, they delight me in I, I'm going to the market is so exciting to an actual farmer's market, meeting the people that grow the food, talking to them about their process. Um, and then there's it's, actually it's a farm. Exciting, isn't it? Because they're showing off <laughs> produce and it all looks so fresh. It's often picked that morning. You can't compare it with no. buying food in a supermarket. Um, absolutely smothered in packaging and plastic. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I, I think farmers markets are a joy to, to just mooch around. And, and that goes back to, to what Carl and I were talking about earlier, that that's a great slow activity. Yes. I know Carl yeah. went through the world famous borough market in London. Uh, it's one of our most famous markets. And there's been a market at borough in London for a thousand years in one form or another. And that just shows the power of, of markets and, and that we need to look after them. 
and that mm -hmm. the market has stayed open throughout the pandemic. Um, yes. Being a, a source of good food and food from all over the UK. And I'm sure you have the same. Where, where, where yes. do you like, which farmer's market do you like to go to? Um, so we, the yeah. Hollywood farmer's market is the one that's closest to me and it's been there a very long time. Um, and it's so nice to, we actually, one of our neighbors is a vendor there. Uh, she works for a farmer who brings in his stuff. Um, but she helps every Sunday to do, um, to run his, uh, stall. And I think it's, that was one of the heartening things that I saw during the pandemic also was that people did not stop going to the farmer's market. You know, we had to queue, you had to wait. It became a different experience from the mixing and the mingling, but people were so dedicated to being there and supporting the people bringing in the food and also wanting to keep that ritual of fresh food coming into their house. It was a really wonderful thing to see. Yeah, I see. And did you find you were spending more time cooking and preparing food? Did it yes. become something more precious to you during the, the pandemic? Yes. yes, I think more people were leaning into the feeling of the ritual, you know, of, of not, not, I, also, I often say um, in a fast paced lifestyle, I burn through the steps. Um, you know, it's like, I need to get it done. I need to get to the result. And cooking came every part of it, going to the market, then prepping it. You know, what music are you listening to? What conversation starts to come into the kitchen? You know, is, is my husband gonna come in and start chopping something with me? Um, and, and I found that the time didn't matter as much either. I wasn't worried about well, when are we gonna set the table? When are we gonna eat? When are we gonna be finished? It's just the whole, the whole experience became a ritual, which was really beautiful. And do you think you will continue? Will, will it change your life? Do you appreciate the opportunity to slow down? Will you continue to take yes. over food and rituals like enjoying preparing food with your, with your husband and enjoying yes. going around the market? Yeah, I think that's something to be protected. I think that's, there have been some really difficult parts of this time period for everyone. Um, but I think one of the things that we can keep, I hope, I will keep it individually, but I hope collectively that we can keep the, we can protect the idea that we don't need to do it so quickly. We don't need to meet these deadlines. Actually, the world isn't gonna fall apart if I, you know, I'm not where I thought I need to be there at seven o'clock and all of a sudden it's taking a little bit longer to caramelize some onions, you know, it's really nice to be able to take your time. Going, going back. And I think people have been very forgiving of that. Absolutely. I, I think we need to learn to slow down. I think, uh, I mean, given the state the planet is in, we need to make lots of changes and it can start with slowing down and, and appreciating what we have and what we need to look after. And that includes the natural world and all the treasures, these wonderful foods that come from this garden, yes. which is uh, an oasis here, need to be protected because it's, you know, it's all under threat. People take it for granted, don't they? They don't even know where their food comes mm -hmm. from, the reality of how food is made and produced, unless you shop directly from farm to fork, which is what uh, ethical hedonists is, is all about, you know, it's about championing the idea of art and culture and slowing down, uh, but also really caring and understanding where your food comes from and to enjoy preparing and cooking food, real food. Yes. I think being, being outside as one of the safer activities has been such a benefit uh, to bring people to the awareness of the incredible health benefits of, of walking, um, enjoying outside time. For us, there's a farm that's about an hour away called the uh, 123 um, Highland Springs Organic Farm. And one of my favorite parts of this year has been tuning into what is actually growing at their farm because at different times of the year, and this sounds so simple, but different times of the year, different things are growing. You can get different things from the farm. And I have grown up a supermarket baby. Right? It's like whenever you want it, you'll get it from wherever and it doesn't matter, even if it's not in season. I don't even know what the seasons are for things in a way that was very embarrassing to me. But I bet you do now. 
you're yes, more aware exactly. of I'm like, oh. that and that it's going to taste so much better if you buy it yes. and eat it and cook it in season. Yes, yes, absolutely. Going, going back to uh, women in Hollywood and great film icons, who, who are you inspired by as, as a female actress? I know you, you know, there are one or two actresses that you admire who've inspired your work. Would you like Yeah, well, I mentioned one of them already. Um, our audience, uh, uh, there's one actress I, I think that you really like and admire. You mentioned, you mentioned her on your website. Oh, Mary Louise Parker? Yes, Mary Louise Parker. Yeah. Yes, yes. You know, I, that was an, that's an interesting, I think I kind of mentioned that um, it's when you are a newer actor, uh, especially in Hollywood, you, people really want to frame you because they don't really know who you are yet. And Mary Louise Parker is a wonderful actress who her roots are in theater. Um, she opened Paula Vogel's How I Learned to Drive, which is an incredible play. Um, and she's also at Harper and Angels in America, which she ultimately did for HBO and did such a nice crossover into TV and film. Um, and she's also in Fried Green Tomatoes, which was actually set in my hometown of Irondale, Alabama. I love that. Yeah. Um, Wonderful film. Yeah, it's such a great film. And that's, you know, she, it's interesting that we even mentioned that because the character she plays in that film is something I would have wanted to do when I was younger. And now I would want to flip. I would want to play the other character. Um, but Mary Louise Parker was someone that people could really kind of frame. Like, oh, you kind of look like her. Oh, you have a theater background. So they're kind of looking for things to they're compare to. They are looking you know? for you a bit. Whereas why can't you just be yourself? They're, they're, it's weird. You know? security in familiarity mm -hmm. yes absolutely it's it's the lens that they can frame you at, they can connect you to something that they understand um and i you know i think that's relationships are that way too it's if you happen to meet someone you say oh you know this is aj she's friends with carrie who you met last year and all of a sudden it's like you feel like you know aj better right so i i understand the framing um and i do i love her work she's a wonderful actress um, that I still am very happy to have comparisons to. But I would say my, my most updated uh, uh, entertainment crush is definitely Phoebe Waller-Bridge. I am so impressed with her work ethic and her, you know, she wears multiple hats so beautifully. She's show running Killing Eve and that gave Amazon a lot of confidence in her to take her show from Edinburgh Fringe Festival into pitching it and having it done and, and starring in it. And Fleabag was so, such an incredible show. Um, and I love hearing her talk about how scared she was to the second season because it wasn't written yet. She had just done that one show and she thought she should leave it. And it ended up being that the second season, uh, you know, I think it won a few Emmys. I think she did okay. Um, but I love hearing her talk about pushing past her fear in her work. And she's someone that I would definitely want to work with. I have to ask you, um, uh, there's a huge buzz around the, the Queen's Gambit. Um, I've yes. written a review of it, and I, I actually think it's the most exciting drama I've seen this year. It's so good. She's extraordinary, the, the yes. actors in it. Yes. Uh, Anya Taylor-Joy. Uh, I mean, you, yes. can't, you can't take your eyes off her. She's, and, and it makes, chess the sexiest activity on the planet and who would I know have that um it's exciting when you when you hear that all the matches that are played in the drama are actually staged by um chess masters it, so it's all yes. it's all based on actual chess games that were played at the world championships in order to make it as authentic and thrilling as possible so and she, she talked about learning to make the moves um, as if she was dancing because she didn't play chess at all before taking mm. part. And she makes it so convincing. But I think it's one of those roles where she absolutely dominates every frame that she's in. And, and, uh, and it's such a journey. Yes, and, and also- Such a journey from being the, uh, the awkward, 
the awkward young woman as the orphan into the incredibly confident. It's it's beautiful. I mean, it's you're almost watching two different people. Um, I just thought she did such an incredible job taking that journey. Yeah, I, I like the way the, the male characters in The Queen's Gambit also adopt her because she has no family, especially after her stepmother mm. tragically dies suddenly too. And she's entered this male world where in the beginning they don't accept her and she's like a freak, isn't she? Mm -hmm. And then yeah. gradually, because she's better than them, they come to admire and care about her. And in mm -hmm. the end, they become her family. I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's an extraordinary fairy tale. I mean, I know that everybody's disappointed that it isn't based on a real person, but it feels like, like it could be because it, it's just mm -hmm. mesmerizing and exhilarating. And I guess, you know, it, it's a, again, a, a thrilling fairy tale. We always want to hear about people who do incredible things against the odds. Do you yes. like playing those sort of characters? Oh, absolutely. I, a very, very difficult start in life, but yeah. they can win through no matter what. Yeah, I think there's such a wonderful feeling when you root for the underdog and you get to see them succeed. I think it's really rewarding for the audience and I think it's really rewarding for the actor um, to, get to, to get to really take the hero's journey, you know? To, to start from the beginning and to to find all of the reasons that you shouldn't succeed because it always feels like there's so many and then to take them on and watch that character grow is uh, that's a rewarding experience for everyone and that show does it so beautifully um i i was i was so impressed to find out that the story was written 35 years ago the novel yes it was a it was a hit in the 80s and yeah. And it's ordinary that it, that it isn't based on a real character, but mm -hmm. I guess the reason why we respond to it is because many of us struggle to do what it is that we're, we maybe have a, a reasonable talent for. And this shows that yeah. if you're prepared to be very focused and really, mm -hmm. really passionate, you, you can own the world. Yeah. If, if anything is possible, I think you can take a lot from, from the Queen's Gambit, if, if you're struggling to be the best at something, it shows that yes. if you're hungry enough and, and dedicated enough to absolutely focus on your, on your passion. Yeah. I think it would be a good time now to, uh, well, your dish is looking incredible. Uh, oh, thank you. Brad, do, do you want to, um, to just show it off to the camera? Where is our, yeah. our lovely helper? Or Indy could do it. Oh, can we just can we show off um, yeah. Brad's oh, back to the Hadikian. wonderful winter dish? Back to the Hadikian plant, especially in the ginger family. Yeah. This is just a handful of ginger, uh, Hadikian berries with a bit of coffee, ground coffee. Could I could I have a? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Got to smell everything because just for a light because up. you know we smell everything before we decide whether we want to oh, eat exactly. it. And, for a wow, wow, that's incredible. It's it's like um, the most sophisticated coffee with, with spice and caramel. It smells extraordinary. It it's really quite intoxicating. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Absolutely delicious. Yeah, it's just um, the Hadikian wow. berries and ground coffee brought about 100 degrees. It's also warming, which again is, you know, we're going to be craving warmth and comfort mm -hmm. this time of year. So yeah, it's brought to 100 degrees. Simmered overnight, uh, let's set overnight to steep, and the next day put for a cheesecloth with a nice aromatic oil. So the actual dish. Yeah, let's just show off this, this dish. And what I will do is publish recipes on the magazine. So for all of you who would like to have a go at making some of Brad's botanical um, dishes mm. using sustainable and organic produce, um, Absolutely. You'll be able to do that. Yeah, um, got the Hadikian... and I'm sure you could find similar ingredients for it um, from your mum. Yes. Um, yeah, this dish, we've got the Hadikian cornbread, Drimus wintari uh, crusted lamb, mm. Arbutus salsa, and that is Swede, a fondant Swede. It's basically cooked with chicken stock and butter, mm. a little bit of rosemary, delicious. and the mm. coffee oil just gives you a nice wake up. <laughs> <laughs> <Good one. laughs> 
<laughs> a wake up indeed. Maybe not oh, that, not to eat too late at night. It'll keep us go. all awake. <laughs> there you have it. Wow. Mm, it smells, it smells absolutely delicious. And it's got this, we want to show off the, the creamy uh, sauce that it's uh, lying in. It it's, looks incredible. Winter of the gardens. Yeah, absolutely wonderful. I think it's time to bring out the chocolate cake absolutely. as we near the end. Could, mm. Indy, could you bring over the, the chocolate cake? Now, I'm, a, I'm going to admit that I am an absolute self-confessed dark chocolate addict. I'm always looking for oh, the guilt-free yeah. chocolate. So this, doesn't it look incredible? Can everybody see that? Mm. This is based on a, on a Venetian recipe and it's a combination of raw dark chocolate um, cacao powder from Peru, which produces some of the finest chocolate. I definitely recommend getting hold of Peruvian chocolate and then ground almonds and eggs, quite a, quite a few eggs and uh, chestnuts. So that's the seasonal ingredient. But you know, the problem oh. with chocolate, a chocolate cake, often it isn't gooey. It isn't gooey and rich and mm -hmm. sticky enough. It can be a bit dry. This is deliciously gooey and budgy. And so the chestnut puree gives it that budginess. And I know that Fran, my friend Fran has tried the chocolate cake because I made it a couple of weeks ago. And then uh, we've embellished it with these wonderfully Christmassy berries again from the garden. So this is the, the strawberry tree. Mm -hmm. Arbutus. This yeah. is the arbutus. And, and then embellished with some rosemary, some aromatic rosemary. Oh, and there's, ro oh. there's actual rosemary in the chocolate cake, which gives it a real sophisticated hit. I don't know if you can see that. Mm. The aromatic flour. oil comes through. And, and rosemary flowers and as well. You can eat the flowers. So I, I think that would make a great alternative Christmas cake. If you're not into, into a, a rich fruit cake, you could make the yeah. fondant cake. And the recipe is already on the magazine for, for everybody who'd like to, to make it. So yeah. I think that you know, I think that would make a gorgeous, gorgeous cake, and it's really, really rich and satisfying. Um, so it doesn't contain any flour. So you just need a, a slice, and it's particularly good with um, delicious organic double cream. There's an amazing dairy in Devon here that makes uh, cream by royal appointment to to the Prince of Wales, which I discovered in Portland and Mason, and. Uh, this is absolutely wow. delicious with a very big, generous dollop of cream. Or you could have yogurt, but I would say, like Julia Child, if you're afraid of butter, eat cream. <laughs> 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 right, I, think, I think it's time for some questions. Um, does anyone have a question for any of our interview guests? Does anyone like to ask a question? Don't be shy. A question for, for Brad or Britt um, or Carl? Any questions? No? There's been a lot. I, I, yeah, I've got a question. Okay. It's for Carl, actually. I'm really fascinated by the whole slowing down process and your sort of conscious decision to do it. Um, how long do you think it took you to sort of fully satisfy that, to sort of get to a point where you could put your past in the past and sort of take your, your new being forward? How, like, how long was that process? So that's a tough question because I didn't, I didn't keep a diary at the time, but it was, it was, it was definitely a couple of years, I think, to be honest, mm. till I actually came out the other end of that tunnel and mm. could look myself in the mirror and think, I'm not in a rush anymore and actually mean it and believe it. I think mm -hmm. it was probably a couple of years with, as I said before, often two steps forward, one back, sometimes a step sideways, uh, but always moving forward slowly, but surely. And was it sort of like a journey? Did your, you sort of took your whole family on it or was it, it was you. And then once you came to your sort of peace, it was, everything got better or did, or did people around you sort of adapt with you? 
I think I think the starting point is always you, but it's the old John Donne thing of no man is an island, right? We're all so connected that it you can't it doesn't really make sense to arrive one day and just declare unilateral slow, right? It's just you're going to be out of step with your family, your friends, your colleagues, and so on. So I right from the start I realized that wasn't going to work, and so for me it was always it was always dialogue was always an, an, explain, an explaining of why I was making changes and doing things differently, trying to bring people along. And I, I realized at first that pretty early on that I, I feared that there would be a backlash, but I found the opposite was true that people, because I think there's so much machismo attached to being fast that we're all hiding behind this veneer of strength, which is associated with speed. And yet behind the veneer, like the Wizard of Oz, you know, we're, we're all cringing and thinking, this is crazy. I'm, I'm, this is way too fast, but no one wants to take the first step. It's like the end of the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, they're in the Mexican standoff and everybody's going, Ooh, looking back, who's going to slow down first. And I think when one person in a circle takes the first step and says, you know what, it's okay, right? I'm going to slow down. The sky is not going to fall in. In fact, all the things I said before will get better. And then that gives permission to other people to start taking similar steps. So I found that within my own circle, there was a kind of ripple domino effect. So I would say, well, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm going to say no to this social outing, or I'm going to switch off. I won't be available 24 hours a day on my phone anymore. Then I began to find out rather than people chafing against that, they would start to do their own version of it. So I think there's a natural inclination to be afraid that you're going to be the weirdo, right? You're going to get left behind all that stuff, but actually scrape a surface a little bit. And I think you'll find that everyone else is wrestling with the same rails. Mm. Oh yeah, no, it's fascinating. I'm, I'm intrigued. <laughs> Do it, <laughs> go for I'll it. I'll try. <laughs> thank, thank you, Carl. Um, are there any other questions? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know whether you can hear me, Alison. So again, for Carl, and I think all of the evening has been really interesting. Do you, Carl, do you think the pandemic will have a an ultimate kind of slowing down of society, A, for now, or B, for the future? It's a tricky one that, I mean, I certainly hope so. I think that we've been forced, the whole world has been forced to go through an enormous workshop in slow, right? It's just been thrust upon us. And I think we've, for better or worse, we've experienced slowness now. And I think some people, I think most people have had some experience of slowing down and some of it we haven't liked. Some of it's been appalling and dreadful and nightmarish, but I think clearly, I mean, then we've, some of the examples have come up here. People have discovered that some things are really rather wonderful slowing down. Yes. So you're already seeing pushback as companies say things like, we want you to come back to the office. People are saying, no, I want to stay at home and control my own time. You know, I work and be more productive, a better employee if I don't have to follow everybody else's speed and get infected by the virus of hurry at the office five days a week. Maybe I'll come in two days a week and the other three days I'll be in charge of my own clock and so on. So we're already seeing people digging in and saying, you know what, some of this stuff was good and I don't want to throw it away when the pandemic ends. So I do think that we're going to hang on to some of these things. All of that being said, I do think I do also think that some people are itching to speed up again. In fact, we've just come out of lockdown um, again here, right? And I, mean, I live in London and I, I was in somewhere that had a, an outdoor um, lavatory um, yesterday. And, and I went in and it was a sports facility. And I, <laughs> there were three guys lined up at the urinal. Um, and all of them were using their mobile phones at the same time, right? It was like this. It's kind of Greek chorus of multitasking. <laughs> and one of the guys who's using his phone was too bad. <laughs> How does that even work? But it's clearly, you know, people are, we're not going to slough off the, um, this virus of hurry and this obsession with more and more faster and faster, the cult of speed overnight. But, but I do think that this, this has been a kind of reset moment. It's up to us now what we do with it. Yeah, thank you. Thank any, you. Any uh, further questions for Brit or Brad? Anyone? Can I just can I just pick up on something that Brit said? We, yeah. that, that word popped up, rituals, and I think that's so so central to all of this discussion. Because in a in a world obsessed with speed and efficiency and productivity and frictionless, right? That awful word, frictionless, from Silicon Valley what gets squeezed out of the equation is rituals because rituals slow us down. They have steps like uh, Britt was saying, right? 
and, and, and we find ourselves in a culture that compels us to burn through the steps. Well, what we should be doing is burnishing the steps, right? You know, enjoying them, savoring the minutes instead of counting them. And I think we've enjoyed this evening a perfect example of, of the, the most ancient ritual of all, which is the, the preparation and the enjoyment of food, right? And I think that's something that the whole sourdough boom, I mean, let's face it, many people have got deeper into food <laughs> than they've ever done before. And I reckon that people are gonna carry, I mean, there's so much, it takes so much work to keep a sourdough starter going. I don't think any, everybody's gonna throw it away once the pandemic ends. And also, this is a, an evening of, of celebration and discussing ideas and not rushing through it. You know, I've watched uh, broadcast programs where it's bang, 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 and, and you just ask the most superficial question. It's not really very interesting. This is a magazine show where we want to explore things in more depth, and I hope you've, you've all really enjoyed it. This is my first, uh, um, this is my third show. I've, I've done three live chat shows and I grew up watching Michael Parkinson and I just love the way he drew people out. And I think there's real room for, for that again, to, to explore topics and people doing fascinating things, being revolutionaries and changing the conversation in, in most interesting ways from film to slowing down, to taking time for, to make food and to enjoy it and to think about where, where, where our food comes from and see it as something really, really, really precious that is utterly delicious and life enhancing. So I hope you've all enjoyed um, this show from, from this extraordinary garden. And if you don't live on the Isle of Wight, I hope you make a pilgrimage to come and see it. It's a place where you can't do anything but slow down. It's that kind of place mm. where you really can switch off and savor just how extraordinary and curious and Alice in Wonderland nature really is. So um, we're going to finish the show by announcing our winners. We have um, some giveaways. Carl has very kindly donated two books. And so we've, um, Indy's going to re read out our winners for the books. Would you like to, to tell us who's won a, a book in order to help them slow down? Yeah, so the lucky winners of the book. Um, the first one is Jane Heath. And oh, the second right. winner is Joanna Corey. I hope I pronounced your last name right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, congratulations. Okay, so we will, um, I've got your emails and we'll, we'll get your addresses to, to drop off. Um, books from, from Carl to you. And then we have a, a winner for the beautiful um, donated sweatshirt, which comes from an artisan ethical um, fashion house based in London called Avon Habit. And so who's our winner for the, for the sweatshirt? Uh, the winner of the sweatshirt is Fran, uh, Fran Arnold Thomas. Okay. So lucky you, Fran. <laughs> well, Fran um, is very interested uh, in art and craft, so I think you'll really, really love the, the sweatshirt, um, Fran. That, that's wonderful. Um, I think you'll really appreciate that. Well, thank you very much um, for coming. And um, we will be back very soon with more foodie culinary adventures, more interviews with exciting um, film and drama. Um, stars. So get ready for, for more ethical headness. Please think about supporting the magazine. We are entirely independent and we depend on subscribers. There are lots of um, beautifully crafted reviews and articles on health and sustainable fashion, hit drama and film, plenty of Christmas reading for you all to slow down. Um, so enjoy, and I will see you again very soon. Happy Christmas. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. bye. And bye to everybody from Brad, from Indy, uh, and Dominic, who's assisting bye -bye. tonight. Thank you all very much. Bye. Um, Thank bye. you. It's been amazing. Thank you. Have a wonderful, wonderful, slow Christmas, everyone. <laughs>